So there's a human side to every mechanical problem. Don't separate. So far, so good. It's amazing how Mary Parker Fall didn't even know anything about DFAS or any of this stuff, and yet she's just she's just hitting every single part on the head. Maybe I'm biased, but I think she's great. All right, so talked about that quite a bit. Now this knowledge management thing. Again, I I, um, I like the idea that she has this uh, this part about next step business management should take is to organize the body of knowledge on which it's to rest. Now she's kind of starting to hit at management as a profession. We have defined science as an organized body of exact knowledge. I mean, you can look up biology or whatever. And this scientific method consists of two parts: research and the organization of knowledge obtained by research. And again, you find this in business, right? Of course, in her time, business management wasn't really an academic field yet. Well, again, it was all engineers. But you find this today. You notice that when a biologist comes up with some sort of a fancy research idea, people that work in like pharmaceuticals, they take note. I can guarantee nobody in the practice world will ever read anything that I will ever publish. It will never happen. So there's some sort of a divide, and this is also holding management back from being a true profession. When a doctor finds some cool way to operate on the heart, what does he do? He shares it, and what happens? All the other doctors read it, and they modify their procedures. Okay? When I point out some cool thing about entrepreneurship, yeah. it's, it's not that cool. It's not that cool. <laughs> Maybe you're at, the Hilton, you're at the Hilton giving a seminar. I wish. Or the Four Seasons. That's, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Is it because people don't want to share like their like practices that they find more efficient, so other uh, corporations don't grow? Or is it because other managements might not be like, no, I like the way I manage, so I will, I don't have to take advice from you of how you may manage your um, whole like group or whatever. I, I, I don't know. There's I not, don't it's know. not the same reference for it, right? Yeah, yeah that's part like, of it. Yeah. They, like they have these journals that they publish their discoveries in. We, plus, everyone is unique in their own. Like for every entrepreneur, every management, there's a different unique way for them to function. Like they every to everyone them. is unique, just like everybody else. So for them like to take someone else's advice. Like it's for example t-shirt. like for example I'm saying that you don't want to follow Cindy's advice in business yeah. because whatever she's preaching in business because you're like, wait, that doesn't work for me or you know, that doesn't fit in my organization or in my culture or my business. So obviously you're not going to follow that. So I think it, it's just different. You don't, you can't really compare it with science. Yeah, but that's what she's advocating that should happen, right? But here's the thing. I agree with you. Like, okay, manufacturing may have many differences from HR, right? But that doesn't mean you couldn't learn something from it. Right. Also, and I, and I, it's still a problem today. We there is very little interface between academic business research and real hard business workers. It, it, I, it's the weirdest thing. Could it be that there's just too much of it out there? Well, there's a lot of science out there. Is that like I'm saying discrepancy between the two? <laughs> I think it depends I mean, on... They should be building on one another. Well, and like Manny says, a lot of managers are just promoted up and don't have any formal training. I think it all depends on really the person. Because if somebody wants to learn and you want to teach it, you could go to like those seminars I've been to one when I was like a receptionist. My ministry said, you want to go and learn something? I said, yeah, so I went. And I learned from this lady of her managing skills of how to manage an office. So it really depends on the person. And if you're willing to go to those seminars and teach what you're pretty, then it'll work. But if you're just going to put it out there then hope that somebody's going to read it, well, not a lot of people do the research to do that part of it. They want, it, they want what's easy and convenient to them. That's not easy and convenient. That's true. And you can make money by doing a seminar. So that's true. And also, some people are just secretive that way that they don't want to use their, they don't want to show their methods to 
to with someone else because you're like, well, what if you try to copy me? So it's oh, like, yeah. I don't want that. That's the old Middle Ages alchemy so. thing, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now I want to talk about what you guys have just mentioned. The her idea that management is always changing. Um, let's see, I guess that would be... We've got 127 here. Let's talk about how she how she looks at it, right? So she says, uh, uh, so I guess 127, 128. I've also been interested in a certain recent committee with representatives from various firms deliberately state as its object the comparison of experience. I should like to know how frank and full their exchange of experience was. But any attempt of this kind is interesting, indicating as it does the attitude on the art of those participating that they expect to gain more by working together. Okay, it's the attitude, just like you talked about. Okay. And they would will lose the old idea by allowing other firms to gain intimate knowledge of their affairs. Jay, just like you said. Uh, let's see. So moreover, we should, not only should we analyze and compare our experience, but we should deliberately experiment. We talked about that too. We should make experiments, observe experiments, compare, discuss these with each other, and see what consensus we can come to in our conclusions. And she goes down a little bit. I heard of a man who made an ice machine which did not work, and the following conversation took, between, uh, took place between him and a friend he met. Friend, I'm sorry to, I was sorry to hear your experiment was a failure. Man, who told you it was a failure? Well, friend, why, I heard your ice machine didn't work. Man said, well, that's true enough, but it was a great success as an experiment. You can learn as much from your failures as you can from your successes, just like we talked about earlier, like you learn from the failures. Okay, and then we kind of shift down. If science gives us research and experimentation as its two methods, and at the same time it shows us that nothing is too small to claim our attention. There's nothing unimportant in business procedure. And then she kind of moves on a little bit. Think about that for a second, though. We learn from failures. We learn by cases. Okay. Things are always changing. And yeah, there are failures, but we learn from those, too. Making sense? Lost anybody? So we talked about reciprocal service. It's almost like that circular reasoning kind of thing. Okay. But this understanding of the word service, I'm on 133, I think it's a good word. It connotates kind of a self-sacrifice, a recognition other, of other aims and private gain. It is a high motive for the individual lives and a social asset. If a man thinks of his business as a service, he will certainly not increase private profits at the expense of public good. Kind of skip down a little bit. A business should think of his work as one of necessary functions of society, aware that other people are also performing necessary functions, and that altogether these make a sound, healthy, useful community. Wow. What what is she saying? What does that mean? Does that not scream of CSR and CSV? When we talk about corporate social responsibility and creating share, that's exactly what she's saying. That it's not so much about making money, but looking at it in terms of value creation and creating something useful for society. That should be our ultimate aim of business. She talks about love of work. And one of our aims is certainly the love of work. A doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a chemist, or an engineer usually greatly cares for his work, chooses it usually for that reason, voluntarily goes to the training necessary for it, often long and strenuous training. She had forgot how she had mentioned how horrible going through a PhD is. Uh, but many avoid drifts into business without having felt any regular urge to do that particular thing. Manny, just like you said. And love of work usually includes satisfaction and work well done. Think about that. How do you love being a manager? How do you love being a manager, though? It's like, well, that's what she's decrying, yeah. right? She's asking that very question. Why can we not have management be a profession like a doctor or a lawyer? And 
it's something that we that we love and we look at reciprocal service and bank management that next step is a profession that's what she's getting at can we not do that that's her that's her question being a manager is also being a leader and that's like a genetic thing too if you're not born into it Mike disagrees with me on this but yeah it's probably that's what that training and education that goes taught. behind I would say you have to be, you're born into it. Look, Look at history. You, you, missed, you missed the whole first part of this lecture. Yeah, I know. It doesn't change my opinion, though. It doesn't change my opinion. You missed it, but you didn't change my opinion. You didn't change my opinion. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank So that's what she talks about. Can, but yeah, can some of it not actually be taught? Can some of it not actually be trained? Yeah, look at the leaders around the world, like Barack Obama and President Donald Trump. When they were kids, uh, Barack Obama was like a president. Uh, he was he was team captain for his like soccer team and stuff. These are all like these are all like evidence played out throughout history that they're born leaders. It's genetically embedded within their system. Or maybe he was a better president because he played soccer. Yeah, one or the other. I mean, but he was he, not none of the fact he was a leader, right? A smaller version, a smaller factor, but regardless of the fact, he was a leader. I mean, you can't, you know, he didn't just, he wasn't a submissive kid who would sit in the back of the classroom and do his work and whatnot. At the age of 45, decided to become the president of the United States. It doesn't, you, you, you kind of have to build into it. You know? So this might be some experiences and training that goes into Exactly. It. It's like, yeah. that's it. So you maybe know. you're not born into it. You're actually, right. you know, it, it, it's a it's product of your experience. Better at it, right? I mean, I was captain of my football team in college, but I'm not the president. <laughs> True, but you are a professor, and that, in a way, I mean, teaches itself that you command other students. So, but I hope I don't command them, I integrate and guide or mentor. Right. You know, anyhow. <laughs> All right, so we talked about, uh, yeah, I mean, just a couple other things that I'll talk about. Alright, so we talked about, we mentioned that. So far so good, guys? Making sense? Uh, managerial style, we are going to talk about here. Okay. What should we talk about? Managerial style. I guess it's not really 138, it's 130. See, I put Cindy, I anticipate. Um. So, Alright, it's at the bottom of the page. Okay, we've been speaking of professional standards as formed and developed through group association. Is there not something in the manner in which those ideals are followed, which you have hitherto connected more closely with the professions than with business? There's a word that means a great deal to me. I wonder if it does to you. That is style. Whatever a man does, whether he's a statesman, or an artisan, a poet, or a tennis player, I like his activity to have the distinction of something we call style. Style, however, is difficult to define. I have seen defined various as adapting form to material, as calculation of means to an end, as restraint, as that which is opposed to all that is sloppy and bumbling in the performance of an act without waste. Others speak of style as broad design, noble proportion. A manager's job performed with style would have all these characteristics. And she kind of shifts down a little bit. Page 140. Style is the fashioning of power the restraint of power. The administrator with a sense of style hates waste. The engineer with a sense of style combines his material. The artist with a sense of style prefers good work. Style is the ultimate morality of mind. She goes down a little further. Style is always the product of specialist study, the contribution of specialism to culture. Hmm. What does she mean? Kind of like what Rashid just mentioned, right? It's there's kind of a build-up, right? And the more you get into it, the more you develop your own style, right? You could have a president that you know, it's a president like he's a soccer player, and yeah, that's part of his style, right? And I remember, um, I remember watching this thing talk about this attorney, and I guess the attorney in his spare time was an amateur boxer, and they said he did his law. You know, on the jury, just like a boxer. You know, you like to move and weave and bob and, 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 and stick and move, right? So everything that we do, it helps us develop our style as a product of our experience and our training. But style is intangible. It's how we kind of bring it all together. It's how we, you know, we develop our restraint on power based on a function of our experiences. And that's what management has that other professions does not have. It's that style. So style is like 
like the outcome of your power. It's like finesse. You know, I really like that. Can you say that one more time? Style is the outcome of your power. Yeah. It's like finesse. Is it like, like finesse? finesse? Yeah, I like this. It's the outcome of your power. It's how you've brought it together. Finesse. Bro. I like that. Yeah, excellent. So what about yeah. Mike? Perfect example, Mike. Mike very well educated, probably one of the smartest people I know. But he's very passive as a human being. He's not aggressive. Is that, I mean, if Mike said, I was, I was talking to Mike, and he was like, if I was put in the position, I would have to take command. But if not, I would always like to be behind the lines. Like, you know, take the order. So, so maybe in terms of style, uh -huh. right, it would be a function of your experiences. Maybe you know that you lead more effectively that way. But I think some people lead, there's different ways of leading. I respect people that maybe know how to speak to other people or maybe know how to lead and, and maybe, and maybe, uh, not so aggressive way. There's different ways of leading, right? But there's also different outcomes of leading. There's also different uh, avenues of utilizing power, right? So like if somebody like Mike is, like Christian said, is passive, doesn't mean that he's not a good leader. It doesn't mean that he's oh, sure. less of a leader than somebody that is more outspoken and maybe expresses himself in a different way. And it has something to do with his experience, right? And that is how he fashions his restraint on power. That is his style. And as a manager or an employee, it'd be easier to speak to him. So it's less intimidating. Well, that's that's less like his skill. Skill. That. And that may be because, I mean, you know, Mike, we're picking on you a little bit, sorry. But that may be because you had a leader that you respected who was like that, and you emulate that style. Yeah. Right? It may not be because you're a naturally timid person, but you think in the workplace that's effective because you had somebody you respected that did that, that, so you emulate that behavior. Or, or you were the opposite. You know, when I was in the Army after my first unit, part of my style was come ain't your high water, everyone was going to eat. Because my first boss never cared whether his people ate or not. And that was part of my style. So I actually did it to be the opposite of him. So you saw something when you had someone else directing you that you didn't like and you made sure you incorporated that And that became your part style. of my style. Yeah. Or we had another guy, we called him Major Barney, because he looked like the purple dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, he had, like, he had like the face and everything, you know. He had that goofy smile, too, and, and the voice. I mean, he, he, we called him Major Barney. Really, these are people that laid down their lives for the country. <laughs> oh, yeah, th this guy's contribution to the war effort was eating all the Otis Spunk by our muffins in the brain room. Okay, let's get that clear. <laughs> and, you know, his style was slurking and hiding around in the bathroom and avoiding work and stuff like that. And, you know, putting the coffee machine, you know, and the thing without the circuit breaker and turning off all the power and everything in the middle of the day. And, but for him, it was all about bathroom, Otis Spunk, Meyer Muffins, and coffee. And yet, it kind of got reinforced this style because every time the colonel came around, he screamed at him. So he kind of cowered in the bathroom as a way to get away from that. And, and so on. So he way. didn't change his behavior. <laughs> It just made it worse. Yeah, he was, he was very happy. It, 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 he has a book on Amazon right now talking about what it's like being a leader in Iraq. Oh <laughs> and I remember reading the abstract. He's like, yeah, it's really, it was really hard being a leader in Iraq when a lot of people didn't know what they were doing. Um, including including you. Yeah, that was great. I really want to buy the book, but I, uh, that, I just, <laughs> I'm afraid of what it says. <laughs> So, yeah, but you see, that's his style, right? Muffins and coffee were more rewarding than actually leading the troops. So style has good and bad connotations. Yeah. That's kind of the way we can conclude I think that. his style is based on the life experiences, obviously. Yeah, 100%. There has to be a reason why he was acting that way in some way. Yeah, who knows? Who knows why? It deprived him when he was a child. <laughs> deprived as a child, he become a major in the U.S. Army. Like, how did that even work? Like, what? Like, Maybe they didn't give him muffins. Now he was eating all the muffins. Well, he was being all he could be, so we can't fault him. <laughs> all right, let me before I wind up before this guy winds up watching my videos and calling me <laughs> from the break room. All right, um, so we talk about yeah. This is another thing, right? I love this. The idea of work is strengthening your spirit, right? And you find this in a lot of cultures and a lot of quotes, right? Voltaire, right? Can anybody read Candide in their high school? Bought by Voltaire. You read it? Yeah, that's the whole thing. Cultivate your garden. Strengthen your spirit. Do something that makes you happy. Okay? Usually with work. Okay? Same thing with Japanese, right? You hear them always say, I'm going to do this because it strengthens my spirit. Okay? Work as the cultivation of character. 
Aristotle says the exact same thing. And we talked about strengthening human welfare already. Is that like how the, the Japanese look at their work? They're very like, they, you know, they get one week of, they get one week holiday a year and they love it, they have a passion for it, they, they do it, you know, they work like 12, 15 hours a day, they, they don't complain. Strengthens their character. Strengthens their character. Is that, is that, I mean, is that, is that similar? Or? It's exactly what she's talking about. Okay, I mean, she's not referring to Japanese specifically, but it's but the same principle. That's yeah. the same principle. 100%. Spain, is there always? <sighs> yeah, what are they? I don't know. Um, like the siesta? Okay. Where they get to, like, close their shops off, I don't know if it's like an hour or two. Yeah, and then they come back to work. They go take a nap, drink yeah. coffee, whatever. When I was in Barcelona, everything closed at like 5 a.m. Yeah, but that's like, I would say the opposite of like... Yeah, I don't know if they're strengthening their spirit. Yeah, right? I don't think they're strengthening their spirit. Well, some of them like it. I mean, they're not as stressed out as we are over here. Right, but in some ways this is about difficulty that you overcome and you become like stronger in the process. Uh, Does that make sense? Okay. You mean more resilient. Yeah, it's a way you become a better person. Your character is developed, right? And you get better style, right? You actually don't get style from not doing anything. Does that make sense? So kind of like just straightening, uh, straightening your... Uh, That's six Spanish wait, people don't do anything in a style right. I just realized it came out wrong. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> so kind of like taking your weakness and turning it into something, and working on it and turning it into something that helpful. Yeah. Yeah. You keep referring to this as an individual aspect. How would you like apply this in societal, in a society aspect, especially since you touched on the European? Like, how do you go back to that? Like, so individuals have to be contemplated where they're at to be able to like fuel society like productively. Or so, if you look at, she does not refer to a lot of this. It's building on Whitehead again. So I'm going to give you the Whitehead background. This kind of integration is actually kind of an anti-individualistic orientation, right? People are not people, but they are pieces contributing to a whole. Does that make sense? So you are contributing to a need or a truth or something like that. It's a very collectivist society that she's advocating for. So individual stuff, you know, me, 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 I, 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 that's actually very much a power over kind of thing. And so she's actually against that. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? So yeah, contributing, you notice it's not, you don't do things so much to contribute to yourself, but a lot of it's contributing to society, the situation. It's only now that she's kind of getting into more of this strengthening of the spirit to kind of reinforce that you benefit too through the process. Is that helpful for you? Okay, let's finish this slide. We'll take a break. So we talked about um, let's see, training and business. Uh, the only thing I was looking at was the bottom of page 143. Man used to think that if this boy was not clever enough for a profession, he must be put into business. Today, we think the business management needs a higher order of intelligence, as thorough as training of any of the learned professions. So you can't do anything else, you go into business, but maybe that's changing. And then, uh, let's see. Yeah. She talks about paying each, I guess it's 144, 145. We work for profit, for service, and for our own development, for the love of creating something. It might be fun to try to do it in one's own life to say, here are the materials of my life. How would the artist arrange them in order to make the tile composition the most significant? I'll skip back then. To come back to the professions. Can we not learn a lesson from the professions on this very point? The professions have not given up the monetary motive. I do not care how often you see it stated that they have. Professional men are eager enough for large incomes. But they have other motives as well. They're offering willing to slice, sacrifice a good slice of their income for the sake of these other things. We all want richness of life in terms of our deepest desire. We can purify and elevate our desires. We can add to them, but there is no individual or social progress in the curtailment of desires. We work for profit, for service, and for our own development for the love of creating something. What do you guys think about that? So don't just work for money, also work for yourself and work for the benefit of society. That's what you like your job. Is that? 
That's why you like you jump. Yeah. And you fight so one is in. It does happen on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> so, at this point, it's about 8 o'clock. Thinking we might do our break like we usually do. Do you guys have any questions before we start our break? You guys, is this making sense? Is it, is it more helpful when I've gone through it? Is it kind of illuminating what's going yes. on? Yes. Okay. So, do a quick break. But you know, quite frankly, 